Chapter 3. Some unusual going on. The next few days passed uneventfully. I was very bored. Our new arrival slept all day, and Chester, whose curiosity has been, had been aroused by the strange behavior of the rabbit that first night, had decided to stay awake every night to observe him. Therefore, he too spent most of his days sleeping, so I had no one to talk to. The evenings have weren't much better. Toby and Pete, who used to play with me as soon as they got home from school, now ran immediately to that silly rabbit's cage to play with him. Or at least they'd try to, but Nicola did not make the most energetic playmate. It took him quite a while to wake up each night, and then, when he did awaken, he didn't do much except hop around the living room, he didn't play cat, he didn't fetch, he didn't roll over to get his tummy rubbed. I couldn't understand why they played with him at all. I except, I ex expect it was because he was new and different, but I was confident that they would soon tire of him and come back to trusty old Harold. Finally, on the on the morning of the first day, I caught Chester blurry eyed over the water dish. He grumbled at me in a most unpleasant manner. You know, Chester, you were never exactly charming in the morning, but lately you will become downright grumpy. Chester growled in response. What are you doing this for anyway? What are you looking for? He's just a cute little bunny. Cute little bunny? Chatter was amazed at my cat analysis. That's what you think? He's a danger to this household and everyone in it. Oh, Chester, I said with an in indulgent smile. I think your reading had gone to your head. It's gone. It's just because I'd read that I know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about? I still don't understand. I'm not sure yet, but I know there's something funny about that rabbit. That's why I have to keep a rod. But look at you. You're exhausted. You sleep all the time. How can you call that a rot? I'm awake when it's important. He sleeps all day, so I sleep all day. So just what have you seen since the first night that makes you uneasy? Well, said Chester, I, uh, that is, at this point, Chester started to bathe his tail, which is a cat's way of changing a subject he finds uncomfortable. He then stumbled sleepily into the living room. So I asked again, followed him, what have you seen? Nothing, he snapped, and proceeded to call up on his chair to go to sleep. After a moment, he opened one eye. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to see. For the next few mornings, it was the same routine. I'd be ready for good romp around the living room, and Chester would go to sleep. Pete and Toby were at school. Mr. Morneau was at the university. He never did too much romping around anyway, and Mrs. Morneau was at her office. No one to play with a poor, neglected Harold. At first, I thought I could strike up a friendship with Bonicula and maybe teach him a few tricks, but I could never wake him up. He was always waking up just about the sunset. When I wanted to take a snooze, a rabbit, I concluded, is cute to look at but it is generally useless, especially as a companion to dogs. So, I would retire each day with my favorite shoe to the road and chew. Now, some people, especially Mr. and Mrs. Murnau, can't understand my taste for shoes and yell at me for snacking on them. But I always say there's no accounting for taste. For instance, I remember one evening when Mr. Murnau picked some of his sour balls out of the bowl by his chair and dropped a green one on the floor. He didn't notice that as it rolled across the room and landed near my, near my nose. I decided this was a perfect opportunity to try one for myself. I placed it in my mouth and wished immediately that I, that I hadn't as the tears started. Running out of my eyes, I thought, what's wrong with my mouth? It's turning inside out. Mr. Murnau immediately noticed that something had happened. What's the matter, Harold? Are you looking for someone to kiss? Help! Help! I wanted to cry. But all that came out was an ooh-ooh-ooh sound. 
I would for days. So, how can anyone who likes green sour balls criticize me for pre preferring for not for trying? Preparing a nice penny roper or a bedroom slipper. But back to the matter at hand. One morning, Chatter had the news. That bunny, he whispered to me across our food bowls, got out of his cage last night. Don't be ridiculous, I said. How could he break through that wire? Look how little he is. That's just it. He didn't break through any wire. He got out of his cage without breaking anything or opening any doors. I looked puzzled. So Chester told me the following story. No, Harold, he said. I don't want you thinking I'm not a good watch cat. But after a few hours of late night, last night, I grew curious about the time. I went into the hallway and, you know, that new clock they've got, the big one. That goes all the way to the ceiling. Well, see, it has this thing in the middle called the a pendulum. At first, I figured I would just leave it alone. It looked like that spool that tied on a string and hung from the doorknob for me to play with when I was a kitten. Every time I hit that silly spool with my paw, it would swing back and hit me on the nose. I hated that toy. So naturally, when I saw this one, I decided not to have anything to do with it. I checked the time. It was midnight. I was all set to go back to the living room when something stopped me. Curiosity? I ventured. I suppose you could call it that. I prefer to think of it as the challenge of the unknown. I put one paw over my nose and reached out with the other one and gave it one good smack. I darn near broke my arm. It's still tender. See how swollen it is. He showed me his little paw. I couldn't see anything wrong, but I knew better than, better than to argue with him. Oh yes, I said, that looks terrible. You must be suffering awfully. You'd better go easy today. He limped dramatically just far enough to display his new handicap and continued. I couldn't even get to the pendulum. Somebody had put glass in front of it, and I was pretty mad. I was all set to go back, but at the same time, I couldn't help watching the thing move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was so easy to watch, and before I knew what had happened, I was waking up. You fell asleep? I asked incredulously. I couldn't help it. I didn't even know it had happened, but I looked up at the face of the clock and it was 12.45. I'd been gone 45 minutes. I ran back into the living room, looked at Bonicola's cage, and it was empty. I couldn't imagine where he was. Then I noticed a light coming from under the kitchen door. I went into the crouch, stalking the light, when... Click. I heard the refrigerator door close, and the light went out. It must have been Mr. Monroe having his midnight snack, I suggested. No, that's what I thought. I jumped on my chair, curled a rear kick, and kept one eye open, pretending to be asleep. Slowly, the door to the kitchen squeaked open. This little head poked out from around the corner and looked to either side to see if the coast was clear. Then, a guess who came bouncing out all by himself, and with that idiotic grin of his plastered all over his face? Well, I guess it was Mr. Monroe, I said. Not unless he wears bunny pajamas and gets very tiny at night. Bonicula, huh? You got it. Unfortunately, I hadn't positioned myself so that I could see him get back into the cage. And I didn't want to let him know that I had seen anything, so I had to stay put. I still don't know how he got out or back in. At this point, Mr. Morna came downstairs to make a breakfast. I wondered if Chatter hadn't dreamed the whole thing. He did admit he'd fallen asleep and, as I've said, he has quite an imagination. 
but I was game after all. There hadn't been any excitement in this place for days. Chester and I took our positions under the kitchen table. We didn't have long to wait. Holy cow! Mr. Murnau yelped as he opened the refrigerator door. He took his funny, he took his funny-looking white thing out of out of the fridge and held it at arm's length. Peter, come down here. What is that? I whispered. That's me. Chester answered. It looks like a white tomato. Very funny, I said as Pete came into the kitchen. Peter, have you been playing with your chemistry set in here? No, Dad. Why? I thought the, I thought this might be one of your experiments. Do you know? Do you know what it is? Gee, Dad, it looks like a white tomato. Just then, Mrs. Murnau and Toby came in the door. What's all the fuss about? Mrs. Murnau asked. We were just trying to figure out what this is. Toby pulled it down so he could get a better look. Well, he said, it looks to me like a white tomato. Mr. Murnau took a good long look. You know, he said to his wife, it really does look like a white tomato. There's one way to find out, said Mrs. Murnau, who always was the practical one. Let's cut it open and see what it, what's inside. Everybody gathered around the table. I jumped up on a chair, and in all the excitement, no one noticed that I had my paws on the table, which under normal circumstances was discouraged, to say the least. Chester wasn't so lucky. Chester, get off the table. Mrs. Murnau said. Chester jumped onto Toby's shoulders, where he stayed to view the proceedings. Mrs. Murnau took her sharpest knife and cut cleanly through the thing. It fell into two halves. It's a tomato, all right, said Mrs. Murnau. Here are the seeds. But it's all white, Toby observed. And look, said Pete, it's dry. So it is, Mr. Murnau said, as he picked up one of the halves. There is no juice at all. Well, and what do you think? It's gone bad, I guess. Though I've never heard a, though I've never heard of a tomato turning white before. Come on, she said, clearing the table. Let's throw it out and have breakfast. And Harold, get your paws off the table. Rat. Chester jumped down from Toby's shoulders and motioned for me to follow him into the living room. This had better be important, I said. They're cooking bacon, a white tomato, very significant. Chatter murmured. So it's a white tomato, I said, edging my way back to the kitchen door. What does that have to do with the bonicula? I can tell you one thing, Chatter said. I got a good look at the tomato. There were very suspicious marks on the skin. So? I believe there are teeth marks. So? So? Tonight, I'm going to reread the book I read last year. How fascinating, I said. As the aroma of a frying bacon wafted across my nostrils, and what book might that be? The mark of the vampire. What? I stopped dead in my tracks. Meet me tonight after the others have gone to sleep. You'd better take a nap today so you can stay awake. Chester closed his eyes. I shifted my look to Bonicula, who seemed to be asleep in this cage. A tiny smile sat upon his lips. A happy dream? I wondered. Or something else? My reverie was broken by the sound of a crunching, crunching bacon. I was in the kitchen in a flash.